Um, so let me, uh, thanks so much, first of all, for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, and first, I, I got to apologize. You know, I, I'm not sure if the video looks reasonable or not. I, I'm, I'm using Zoom in my browser. There's always like stuff that goes wrong. I, I feel like it, the video is messed up. But anyway, it's some, some semi-accurate representation of what it looked like. That's not important. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk at this workshop on benchmarking in, in the data center and in, in the cloud. Um, the talk I want to tell you about today is more like algorithms and applications focused. So I'm not going to talk too much about actually like doing benchmarking in the cloud per se. But I hope you know what I talk about today uh, can kind of inspire you, and especially if you're working on graph algorithms, to implement some interesting graph algorithms and, and consider expanding the set of benchmarks you use when you're um, running graph algorithms and benchmarking them, which is a topic that I think many people in PPOP are interested in. So in this talk, I'm going to give, um, I'm going to tell you about some of the recent work on benchmarking graph algorithms that I've done. Um, with my collaborators, many of my collaborators, on multi-core machines. Um, I want to tell you about some of the programming interfaces that we use and some of the algorithm, algorithmic approaches and challenges that we are kind of currently investigating. So I'll give you an overview of this benchmark suite that we've built called the graph-based benchmark suite. I'll tell you how to solve a particular problem called k-core in GBBS. And then in the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about hierarchical clustering. And that's also work that's built on top of GBBS. And that's some ongoing work we're doing with folks at Google. So if you have a lot of graph data, um, you know, a, a lot of the classic work on graph processing basically said, you know, you have, you have big graph data, let's just run it on distributed machines. So starting with Pregel, there's a whole slew of work on using distributed graph algorithms to solve problems on massive graphs. However, it turns out that for all but the most massive graphs, and you probably don't have graphs like this unless you're, for example, at Riken or at Facebook or Google, um, the graphs you probably have easily fit within a commodity multi-core machine. Um, and, and for example, even the largest publicly available graph today, the Web Data Commons hyperlink graph, which has like four billion, about 4 billion vertices and 128 billion directed edges, it's like 225 billion edges once you symmetrize it, that, this graph fits comfortably in the main memory of a multi-core machine with 72 cores and a terabyte of main memory. And you could rent a similar machine um, for about $10 an hour on Google Cloud or AWS. Um, you could actually buy a machine like this for yourself. Um, you could probably get one pretty cheap on eBay now. Um, for maybe like 10 grand, okay? So it's, a, it's a, something you could buy and keep at home and run, and you could solve whatever you, you want on it. Um, and so the question actually, you know, given that we can actually fit this graph in the main memory of this machine is, well, how do we all actually solve a, a wide class of useful problems on this machine? And can we do it faster than existing distributed approaches? So in our work, it, it turns out that this answer, answer is yes. And um, the work that I've, I've been doing with my collaborators since my PhD has kind of uh, established this for a wide class of problems, many of which are shown here. So we, we've shown that we can actually design simple and efficient algorithms for a wide class of graph problems, um, most of which are actually very useful and interesting in practice. And there's over 20 problems. I'm showing a subset of them here. Um, there's probably closer to 30 implemented now. And these span a wide range of application domains, spanning everything from you know, graph connectivity problems, um, classic kind of page rank or eigenvector problems, subgraph problems, which are also related to clustering, um, covering or symmetry breaking problems, and finally, a, a many shortest path problems. And in, in, in all cases, um, as far as I'm aware, these GBBS algorithms that we've implemented achieve state-of-the-art results on, and, and, and they, act, they can actually scale to the largest publicly available graphs, including the Web Data Commons graph that I just mentioned. So this is a, a plot um, showing you know, a subset of our results um, from 2018, actually. Um, and, and since then, the, the implementations have gotten even faster. But this is a representative set of results on the Web Data Commons hyperlink graph. And so for all of the problems shown on the x-axis here, uh, we, we, we show the running time on the y-axis, and this is the running time in seconds. So after you've loaded this graph into the main memory of your machine, it takes on the, uh, between you know, 10 seconds to, at most, few, a few minutes to solve all these problems. And the exception to this, there, there are some exceptions to this. For doing something like triangle counting or fork fleet counting, it takes much longer. It'll take on the order of you know, hours to tens of hours, because the, the total amount of work the algorithm has to do is much higher, but it's still very fast. Now, I want to give an example um, of graph connectivity and kind of compare our, our shared memory results with um, existing external memory and distributed memory results. So um, the, the GBBS or shared memory result is shown in green here. And the blue results are external memory, and the orange results are distributed memory. And what we're showing on the left-hand side is the running time in seconds versus on the x-axis, it's the memory used. So this is some measure of like the hardware that the implementation is using. And similarly, another measure of hardware is the number of processors. And that's what the plot on the right-hand side is showing. And what we find is that using you know, a comparable amount of um, resources, for example, um, memory, right? So on only using like a slightly, slightly more memory, we're able to get uh, like orders of magnitude better running time compared to the external memory results. And we're using orders of magnitude less memory than the distributed memory results. 
And similarly, using orders of magnitude fewer processors than distributed memory, memory results, we were able to actually get faster running times than these existing state-of-the-art distributed memory results. And all of these algorithms that we're implementing are you know, fairly similar. So I, I think the distributed memory results are implementing some, some version of the sherlock Rishkin um, connected components algorithm. And the GVBS algorithm is implementing a work-efficient connectivity algorithm that I, I'm happy to talk more about. So um, in a nutshell, you know, we're, we're kind of at this sweet, sweet spot using um, shared memory computing. And that's probably not too surprising to you if you've used shared memory computing. But it, it sort of begs the question, you know, when, for what kind of problems should we um, actually use high performance computing resources and distributed memory resources? Um, and I think the, the main message here is that if your problem fits in the main memory of a multi-core machine, and it's not incredibly computationally expensive, it's memory bound and has a lot of synchronization, it sort of behooves you to use um, shared memory tools and algorithms as much as possible. So let me tell you, um, you know, a bit more about kind of what's happening inside of the system. So we have a focus in our system on work efficiency and actually providing theoretical guarantees about the algorithms that we're solving. And so um, to, to, to say more about that, let me, let me define um, the kind of theoretical framing for shared memory algorithms and in particular shared memory graph algorithms. So we, we, um, we study all of these problems in the work depth model, which is a shared memory model. And you think about your algorithm as a computation DAG. And the work of an algorithm is the total number of vertices in this computation DAG. And the depth of an algorithm is the longest chain of sequential dependencies in this computation DAG. And that's also like the parallel running time if you had an infinite number of processors. And so something like Brent's scheduling theorem shows you that the running time of a, uh, an algorithm doing greedy scheduling on this DAG is the work over the number of processors plus the depth. And you can actually achieve this asymptotically using something called a work efficient scheduler, which is provided in tools like Silk, and also um, there are similar efficient schedulers in OpenMP, TBB, and so on. And so you can actually uh, obtain a running time of work W over P plus O of D. And so given this, our goal is now to design um, and, and express the parallelism in a, for a problem to get a work efficient algorithm. So an algorithm that has work that's asymptotically the same as that of the best sequential implementation and has polylogarithmic depth. And what we find um, is that, you know, the, the, the parallel algorithms literature, especially if you look at all of the parallel algorithms people have developed since the 1980s, there are actually a, a many beautiful work efficient parallel algorithms to draw on. And it turns out that these algorithms are also highly practical. So many of the algorithms that we're implementing are not new algorithms that we've implemented. We're actually just giving efficient implementations of these existing kind of classic parallel graph algorithms that people designed back in the 80s. And they turn out to be highly practical if you implement them efficiently using work efficient primitives. So next, let me tell you kind of about this next part, which is how we build the system to actually implement algorithms and ensure that the algorithms are theoretically efficient. And before I move on, I just want to emphasize that the work in, in for most of our problems, the work is actually work efficient. So it's, it's the same asymptotically as that of the best sequential algorithm. And there are just a few cases where the work um, is maybe increased by a factor, for example, of the diameter of the graph. And that's for certain shortest path problems. Uh, where getting efficient parallel algorithms that are work efficient and have good parallelism is known to be um, notoriously kind of hard. It's a big open problem in parallel graph algorithms. So in a nutshell, this graph processing system that we build called GVBS is written in C++ and is designed in the lineage of the LIGRA graph processing framework, if you're familiar with that work. That appeared at PPOP about 12 years ago, about 10 years ago. Um, so the core interfaces that we use in our algorithms are that of a graph and a vertex. So algorithms basically think about implementing, um, uh, like using this sort of high level API over graphs and vertices. And most of the API is written in this sort of functional style. And I'll, I'll show you this in more detail in the next few slides. So for example, you, know, you might um, have an algorithm which is performing maps or reductions over the neighbors of a vertex. And you can do this pretty cleanly using a single um, primitive and like passing in an, an, an anonymous function without really getting into the low level details of how a vertex neighborhood is represented. So in, 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 to, to make that concrete, an algorithm basically is templatized over this graph type, and it's kind of using the graph like a concept. And so the algorithm doesn't really care about what the internal representation of a graph is. And this sort of um, separation of concerns also lets us do a lot of optimizations under the hood inside of the library. For example, we can support lossless graph compression completely under the hood, invisible to the user, and some other optimizations. So in particular, with compression, we can take this web data comments hyperlink graph, which has like 225 billion edges, in the symmetric version, this takes about a terabyte of memory to store uncompressed in the compressed parse row format. And by applying lossless compression, we can store it in 350 gigabytes of memory, uh, which is about 1.56 bytes per edge and 2.6x 
like less space than the uncompressed version. And so if you're running on a memory limited machine, this kind of this uh, compressed storage gives you back enough space to maybe store some algorithm specific data and solve more problems on this graph. So finally, after um, compiling down to these graph representations, the entire code is compiled down to Parlay. Uh, this is a lower level library for parallelism called ParlayLib. Um, and finally, from ParlayLib, we map everything down to parallel runtimes, like, for example, Silk or OpenMP. So this figure here shows the Vertex API in a little bit more detail. So the main thing I want to highlight is that the primitives are mostly what you'd be familiar with if you are familiar with like a functional programming language. Um, so things like maps, reductions, performing counts or filters. We also have some mutating primitives, which you wouldn't have in a functional language. I um, mean, that's useful for certain graph algorithms, which in order to get work efficiency, have to actually delete vertices um, from the neighbor lists of a graph. And I want to emphasize that all of the algorithms have, um, all of these primitives have good bounds on their work and depth. Now, this is the interface um, for performing operations that operate on the entire graph. And again, the primitives are quite functional. So things, you can do things like filtering a graph where you apply a predicate function on a, on a, on a graph and get back a new graph um, representing the graph with all of the edges that don't satisfy, with, with all of the edges that do satisfy that predicate. Um, and similarly, there's a bunch of other functions that um, allow you to kind of explore and expand on um, a subset of vertices and on their neighbors. Um, and these are these vertex subset operators here. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but again, I want to emphasize that all of the primitives have um, concrete bounds on their work and depth in the worst case. So let me let me show you an example of how we kind of apply this um, framework, GBBS, um, this library end to end on, on a particular application. So let's consider solving um, the K-core problem. And I'll, I'll give you a work efficient algorithm for K-core that's implemented inside of GBBS. So the K-core of a graph given an undirected graph is the maximal connected subgraph of, of the graph where all vertices in this subgraph have degree at least k. So you're given some k, like say k 1,000, and you want to find a, a subgraph where all vertices inside that subgraph have degree induced degree, where that, that's degree only using vertices in that subgraph, at least 1,000. And you know, so that gives you a different subgraph per k, but you, you can kind of intuit that maybe that these subgraphs are somehow included with by containment, so they're, they're laminar. And what, you know, instead of finding a particular subgraph, we might be interested in computing the largest k such that a vertex is in a k-core. And this is called the coreness value of that vertex. So um, a kind of generalization of this k-core problem is to find the largest k such that uh, that vertex is in a k-core for every vertex. So in this example shown here, um, the outermost circle, this light blue circle consists of all vertices in the one core. Actually, all of the vertices are in the one core. And for the two core, some vertices are excluded because they're not, um, they don't have induced degree at least two. And, and then finally, the three core consists of this four clique in the middle here. And wh why is k-core useful? Uh, well, it's, it's a very simple algorithm. Um, it's easy to run and implement. And it runs in you know, linear time. There's an efficient sequential linear time implementation of this algorithm. And it has a lot of applications since it was kind of first defined in the 1980s, for example, in social network analysis, doing fraud detection, um, and in clustering both social and biological networks, among many other applications. So what do we do? How do we implement this algorithm in GBS? Well, we implement um, what's called a peeling algorithm for this problem. And you know, indeed, I, I, pretty much all of the algorithms, efficient algorithms I know for K-Core, work by doing the sort of iterative peeling. So the algorithm works by iteratively removing or peeling vertices with degree one. So you start by peeling all the vertices with degree one. And when some degree vertices, some degree one vertexes are removed, the, the degrees of other vertices, in particular their neighbors, can actually go down. And so if, an, if a neighbor's degree now becomes you know, at most one, you remove it. It's also peeled and you keep doing this until you um, can't remove any more degree one vertices, until no, no further ones exist. Then you move on to degree two and so on until the entire graph is peeled. So clearly this, you can implement this algorithm in parallel by just removing all of the degree one vertices at once. And, and, and then what you wanna do is update the degrees of their neighbors in parallel. So conceptually, it kind of helps to think about this algorithm as storing a bucketing where the vertices are placed into a bucket corresponding to their current degree. Um, so initially the vertices are placed in the buckets corresponding to their initial degrees. And then we take the, the vertices in the first bucket or the, the, the lowest current bucket and remove them from the graph. And when we remove them, we want to update their neighbor's degrees. 
and then move the neighbors into new buckets, and in, in, in particular into lower buckets. And we'll just keep doing this. And so we'll have, you know, you can imagine having a bucket corresponding to one. And these are, and all the vertices that end up in bucket one are going to be vertices with coreness value one. So to avoid mixing um, kind of the description of this high level peeling algorithm with the low level details of bucketing, we designed a simple API for implementing bucketing inside of GBPS. And this makes it kind of simple to implement both KCore as well as other bucketing based graph algorithms, which of which there are a few, um, few more, actually quite seemingly unrelated to KCore that can be you know, described using bucketing. So the bucketing API has just a few primitives and lets us, for example, um, call this make buckets primitive, which initializes the buckets using uh, an initial degrees, the initial degrees of the vertices. It lets us extract all the vertices in the smallest bucket. And these are the vertices that are then peeled and have their coreness value assigned. And finally, it lets us update the buckets for a given subset of vertices. So using this API, we can give a, a very simple and short pseudocode for the K-core problem. And I've shown that on the figure on the right. Now, this, this is actually pseudocode from a paper that we wrote, but the real C++ code is actually not that much more complicated. It's about 50 lines of C++. And importantly, because the bucketing primitives have provable bounds in their work and depth, we can actually analyze this algorithm and show that it runs in linear expected time and has depth proportional to the peeling complexity of the graph. And this is just the number of rounds of this parallel peeling process that I just described in the earlier slides. And this algorithm, um, as I described it, it actually turns out to be the first work efficient algorithm for KCore that has non-trivial parallelism. And using this algorithm or implementation, we can actually solve KCore and compute the coreness values of every vertex on the WDC graph, the Web Data Commons graph, in about three minutes. And that's on that same one terabyte memory machine that has 72 cores. So if you're interested, I could chat a bit more about this and you know, compare it with some distributed implementations that I'm aware, aware of. But from the perspective of benchmarking, uh, what's interesting to me is this is a problem where you know this this row value, the number of peeling rounds you need to do is is pretty large. It, it seems to scale kind of like square root of n, and so for big graphs with like a few hundred billion edges, uh, this is this is like a non-trivial number. And if you try to run that many kind of synchronous peeling rounds on a distributed memory machine with a bunch of machines, uh, just the synchronization overheads are going to kill you. And so that's why we were able to run this pretty quickly on a shared memory machine. You know the work is low. It's you know, able to exploit most of the memory bandwidth on a machine. Um, but it, it seems like the, the, the thing that's limiting us from scaling this on distributed machines is the sort of peeling complexity. And it would be interesting to think about what kind of systems we should build to scale this up to even larger graphs that don't fit in a single machine and, and do it efficiently in a distributed setting. So I now want to switch gears a little bit and tell you about some kind of more recent work that we've been doing on, on parallel graph clustering. And this you know, the, the main point I want to convey is that the, there are some very interesting and useful problems in practice. And I think they present new and, you know, they, they present really new and interesting challenges for graph processing systems. So let me tell you a little bit about these algorithms and give you a, a high level idea of what kind of primitives we need to implement in the next generation of graph processing systems to implement these kind of algorithms efficiently. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to tell you in the next part about this classic algorithm for clustering called hierarchical agglomerative clustering or hack. So the input in the graph setting for hack is a weighted similarity graph. And in the similarity graph, the edge weights represent how similar two vertices or objects are. So you can imagine generating this by, for example, computing a K and N graph on a set of objects, or maybe as the output of some other machine learning algorithm. And what we'd like to do is cluster these graphs together to group more similar vertices to be in the same cluster. So the algorithm, the hack algorithm is incredibly simple and works as follows. In each step, the algorithm basically merges sequentially. It's going to do this in this greedy manner. It's going to merge the two most similar clusters. So that, that's going to basically take the highest similarity edge and merge the two endpoints of that edge together into a single cluster. And it just repeats this until there's only a single cluster left in the graph. So there's two kind of immediate questions. Um, well, first, how do we define most similar, especially once we've, you know, we've got clusters consisting of a number of vertices, what do we mean by most similar? And secondly, what's the output of the algorithm? So we define cluster similarity between clusters containing many objects by basically using all of the edges between these underlying objects in both clusters. So some of the most popular ways of doing this, this is called a, a linkage function. And you could do this, for example, by taking the max weight edge across this cut, the min weight edge, the sum of the edges across the cut, or the um, average weight of an edge across the cut. And this is actually a very popular approach in practice. 
Um, and I just want to emphasize that this last measure, which is the one that we focus on, is normalized over all possible edges in the graph, include, including some of the non-edges, because we're norm normalizing by the product of the two cluster sizes. And this is called the average linkage measure. And again, this empirically yields the best results um, for this unsupervised clustering algorithm. And for the output, well, the output of this algorithm is a dendrogram, or a, a, a vertex-weighted tree where the weight of uh, internal vertex is the similarity of the merge that creates that vertex. So if you're given this tree, you can actually cut this tree at any level given a similarity threshold, and that yields a set of flat clusters that then you can use in some downstream analysis. So let me show you an example to kind of illustrate this algorithm and the kind of operations we need to support. So in this example, the highest similarity edge in this graph with six vertices is this edge of weight 0.8. So we're going to merge those two vertices together and create a, a cluster of size 2. The next high similarity edge is this 0 0.7 similarity edge. So we'll merge those two vertices and create another size 2 cluster. And now we, to find the next high similarity edge, well, one of the similarities is um, this similarity between the size 1 cluster on the top left and the size 2 cluster in the middle. And that has a similarity of 0.25, because uh, it's a 0 0.5 divided by the product of those two cluster sizes. And the edge between the two kind of size two clusters is 0.225 using the same exact formula. So we need to kind of figure out um, the similarities between these clusters now. And one way we can do this is by kind of eagerly contracting vertices together into a graph, into like using a dynamic graph implementation and keeping these edge weights up to date. I just want to note that there are no kind of efficient implementations of this idea Despite being pretty simple and natural, there's no existing dynamic graph implementations that can support this efficiently, especially when you're implementing a parallel algorithm and many of these merges are occurring simultaneously. And so it's sort of an interesting challenge um, for future graph processing systems to implement, to have um, functionality that supports implementing algorithms like the one I've just illustrated here. So um, on the theory side, we kind of, we looked at this problem, we started thinking about graph-based clustering. And we realized that not a lot of work had been done on this. And it was actually open whether you, know, you could actually do anything uh, better than quadratic time, even to compute this algorithm exactly, this greedy algorithm run sequentially. And we gave a positive result for this in, in pretty recently, in 2021. And we showed that for sparse graphs, we can actually give an algorithm that runs in n times m to the 0 0.5 time. And so for graphs that have fewer than like n square edges, this is going to be a, a subquadratic time algorithm. And that's an improvement over what we knew before. And there's some interesting things um, about you know, how, to, how this works. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into it. I'll focus more on parallel algorithms. So for parallel algorithms, which is what we were originally really interested in, um, we started out by finding, an, unfortunately, a negative result. We showed that getting the dendrogram from this, this greedy process is actually p-complete. And this might not be surprising to you if you're familiar with greedy, like greedy parallel algorithms. Um, so we give this by a reduction from the circuit value problem. But this is, this is sort of disappointing. Right? We would really like to get back this uh, hierarchy, because empirically, when you compute this sequentially, the hierarchy quality is very, very good. And you could cut it at some level by you know, maybe doing some binary search on, this, on these thresholds and get a very high quality unsupervised clustering of your objects. So we, kind of, um, we gave a positive result from this by defining um, a, a notion of approximation that was actually there in, um, in the literature prior to our work. Um, and so we use this kind of natural notion of approximation um, to bypass this lower bound and obtain a, an algorithm that's work efficient and has low depth. And so the idea is to allow the algorithm, this notion of approximation basically allows the algorithm at every step, instead of, merge, instead of being forced to merge the highest weight edge, we're allowed to merge any edge that's close to the max similarity edge. And what, by close, we mean it's within a multiplicative factor of one plus epsilon of the max weight edge. And it turns out that this small amount of flexibility is enough to actually bypass the lower bound. It's actually also enough to bypass the um, you know, super, super linear running time that we had for the sequential algorithm. So we can not only give a near linear time and near linear work algorithm, we can also get low depth. And this also turns out to be a very um, fast and scalable parallel algorithm in practice. So the idea in a nutshell works as follows. The idea is to um, work over a logarithmic number of stages and in each stage, we're going to consider the edges between the current max weight in the similarity graph and the max weight divided by 1 plus epsilon. And the goal for the algorithm that we run in a stage is to basically perform submerges between these like almost exact edges 
and ensure after a, a few, like a polylogarithmic number of rounds, that no, no more edges exist inside of this stage. And so the main question is how do we implement the stage efficiently to run in low work and depth? So the main observation um, that we, we exploit is that if we look at one of the vertices that exists that has a non-zero number of edges in a stage, and if we consider all of these like almost exact edges incident to it, we can actually merge a constant fraction of those almost exact edges while preserving the fact that each of the edges we're merging is almost exact. If we actually kind of linearize those edges and look at the edge weights of applying each one of those merges sequentially, we, we can still ensure that they're almost exact. In particular, it becomes like one, point, one plus epsilon squared. Um, and so the, the problem now is to find this kind of large subset of edges that we can merge. And the idea there is to basically perform a random two coloring of the vertices and find basically a B matching between uh, vertices of one color and vertices of the other color. So there's some kind of details here, but it turns out you can implement this algorithm pretty efficiently. And what this algorithm actually needs in, you know, in the underlying graph representation is a way to perform a large number of these merges um, simultaneously and update the new kind of merge edge weights based on the average linkage formula. So this is pretty much all I want to say in theory. We, we proved that we can you know, do this in a polylogarithmic number of rounds. And overall, this gives us a, a near linear work algorithm that runs in polylogarithmic depth. So our implementation of this algorithm was done in GBBS using GBBS and Parlay. And the input to the algorithm is a similarity graph. And we consider running this algorithm on two types of graphs, both K and N graphs and um, real world kind of large real world graphs, similar to the web data comments, actually including the web data comments hyperlink graph. And so the question, there's two questions. Well, one is how scalable is the algorithm? And the other question is, is this still a useful algorithm when we use this notion of approximation? The good news is that approximation doesn't seem to, you know, empirically seems to affect the quality of the algorithm very little. And so even using fairly large values of epsilon, we get very high quality results when using some um, standard um, quality metrics like ARI. So a higher ARI in this figure is better. And we find that our algorithms are getting ARI that's almost the same as that of the exact algorithm, irrespective of how dense the kind of K and N graph that we're running on is. And these are for some data sets with ground truth. Now on the other hand, on the scalability side, we're actually able to scale our algorithms to be much faster than the state-of-the-art metric clustering algorithms. So using this kind of graph-based clustering approach, um, by running on a sparse graph, it might be kind of unsurprising that um, we, we can do much better than kind of running on the, in the metric setting where you're considering the entire order n square size um, distance matrix. And so we, in, in the limit, we're getting a, at least a 400x speed up. This is the largest size input we were able to run using fast cluster. Um, and we're over 400 times faster than fast cluster in this case. And finally, we, we um, did some scalability evaluation on our large uh, web graphs. And in particular for the hyperlink, the Web Data Commons hyperlink graph, we're able to run three algorithms on this graph. And we find that, well, Parhack has the highest quality um, and it runs in about um, a few hours. So it runs in three hours on this graph, which is actually much, like, much higher than the um, other kind of simpler classic graph algorithms I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. Um, and there's some more, more simple graph clustering algorithms, including par affinity, which is essentially an MST-like algorithm. And that can actually be run in 10 minutes on this you know, 100 billion scale graph. And so an interesting question for future work is, well, to, to design better implementations of these kind of graph data structures, and to also consider kind of running these graph algorithms um, on using high performance computing and, and kind of in, including these more complicated uh, graph problems I'm discussing in this talk in future graph benchmarks. And so in summary, I, I told you in our, about our work on the graph-based benchmark suite. And this is ongoing work that um, you know, kind of started during my PHP, my PhD, and really during um, my um, postdoc advisor's PhD. So it's, it's kind of a long running work. Um, we're looking for more collaborators. So if you're interested in kind of using our, our implementations, uh, we'd, we'd love for, to hear from you. And so these implementations are actually being used at Google. Um, and so I, I'm very happy to take some questions now if we have time. So I think there's like 30 seconds, but. Thanks, Lakman.